them on the air, but we weren't set up till today. Tom Edlin, who is often a writer in the New American Magazine, I saw him speak last week in Madison on the Constitution, which we all think we know, but we don't really know much about it. In fact, too many judges, too many politicians don't know much about it. And Tom Edlin from Massachusetts, where he's teaching school and where he's got students who have a chance if they go to his class, joins us now and from the Bay State. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Mitch. Well, it's good to have you on the show. And uh, I think the first question will be this this debate that we have uh, often at the bar at home on whether the Constitution is a living or a standing document. And when the people that say it's a living document, they say, well, wait a minute, uh, it once said we had three-fifths of a person in there, so we can't go back to those times. It wouldn't be realistic. And to that, you say what? Uh, the three-fifths uh, provision was repealed. Uh, you know, we fixed the Constitution by amending the Constitution. So we passed the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, and that fixed the three-fifths uh, problem, which it was a flaw in the Constitution. And, you know, to a certain extent, you, you could argue that we are a living Constitution in the sense that, you know, we're applying uh, the principles that laid out in the Constitution to new situations. You know, when we talk about the Fourth Amendment right to freedom of privacy from government searches in our houses, papers, and effects, uh, effects means our, our electronic communications. You know, we don't do paper that much anymore. But my experience has been that most people who talk about the Constitution being a living document, they really mean dead letter. They really mean, let's ignore the Constitution and, and let's pretend uh, not to follow this one provision that I don't like. Yeah, which is ridiculous. Now, on the, the question of the, uh, the, the 19th Amendment, uh, we had Rob Reiner and others who were arguing for the uh, Proposition 8 to be struck down in California on gay marriage, and he said women and gays, he said, always had equal rights in the Constitution. They just are being denied it. And Judge Scalia would say, not true. The the women did not have the right to vote until we had to amend the Constitution, the 19th Amendment. So you can't have it both ways, right? No, I, I mean, you know, most of our founding documents, including the original Constitution itself, uh, doesn't mention, uh, actually it doesn't mention, uh, you know, gender uh, in general, um, you know, it just talks about no person, uh, per, you know, women are persons as well. Um, I believe, I'm trying to remember, I believe the 15th Amendment was the first one where it talked about, used the, used the phrase gender, or at least um, I know that there was a, at the time it was adopted in 1870, there was a growing women's rights movement, and they wanted um, uh, ex- explicit in- inclusion of women as it, with uh, having the right to vote. And uh, it was it was not included in the Fifteenth Amendment, and uh, you know even though though in a couple of states uh, they already had the right to vote in Wyoming and a few of the Western states they they had already by the Fifteenth Amendment had the right to vote. I mean they weren't states at the time, but they were um, they allowed women to vote. So it was a state by state thing before the Nineteenth Amendment. Well, Judge Scalia has written that the Fourteenth Amendment, which provides equal protection, does not provide equal protection for gays. It, it doesn't stop states from doing that. But he said it itself does not. And so when we talk about gay marriage, there's been this fight over whether equal protection is already there in the 14th Amendment. Well, yes, I mean, equal protection, but uh, for every for every person, but that doesn't mean we need to start rearranging our definition of, of, of terms. Uh, two guys has never made a marriage, uh, you know, before the year 2000, and never made a marriage in any country, any culture, any society, any religion. Uh, you know, occasionally religions would allow uh, more than one wife uh, to a husband, but never it was uh, were there two husbands or two wives. And um, you know, to, to rede- redefine that and say, oh, well, that's a right, that's under equal equal opportunity uh, that's that's a stretch uh, it's more than a stretch it's it's really unlearning the meaning of words well in 1868 if, if somebody said oh this is great we passed the 14th amendment that means gays can get married that means women can vote somebody would have said you're crazy right I mean, oh yeah I, you know it, that absolutely i mean of course at the time you know most of the i shouldn't probably all of the states had 
laws against uh, against sodomy, and then they were not very regularly prosecuted. But you know, occasionally, if uh, it became um, too public, or uh, you know, or just as if you get too public with with uh, heterosexual uh, behavior, uh, then you know they would prosecute. But um, uh, the, you know, the the whole attitude, the whole country was based upon the idea of of the Christian ideal. Uh, you know, it, we come from uh, England. England had a state church. Mass- Massachusetts, at the time of the founding of the Constitution, had a state church. It didn't violate the First Amendment because it just said Congress shall make no law establishing religion. Um, you know, I, Massachusetts had a state church until 1832. Uh, that's almost 50 years after the Constitution. You know, and I'm not saying that's a good thing. I, I think it's good that Massachusetts on its own decided not to pay ministers out of the um, state treasury, but uh, simply to point out that we, you know, we have this 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 heritage of uh, you know a worldview, and uh, you know a lot of people say, oh well, well, you know that doesn't matter. We uh, you perhaps- said Congress shall make no law, but haven't judges taken that to mean the states as well? In some cases, like nativity scenes and other things, they will say that's establishment of religion. Well, I mean, they have, and and you know there is. You know, when the Fourteenth Amendment does guarantee uh, individuals against uh, trespasses on their rights by states, uh, you know, the the purpose of it was to to stop the black codes that had been erected in areas of the South after the Civil War, where they, you know, they they would the uh, states would pass laws saying, well, if a black man is out after dark without, um, you know, a, a permission note, he can be whipped. Uh, you know, black men can't vote, they can't serve on juries, et cetera, et cetera. So they passed the 14th Amendment. Um, but that's a long way from saying, well, gee, a state which had already been allowed to establish a particular church can't, under the 14th Amendment's Equal Opportunity Clause, uh, put up an activity scene. I mean, I don't even know what church that would necessarily uh, establish, you know, if, if the little town puts up an activity scene or if or if they have a... You know, if they pray uh, well, the 23rd Psalm in, in, a, in a public school, I mean, that what church does that establish? Well, we've come to the uh, point now where you don't even have athletic teams, can't even do a prayer in public. They, they do it in the locker room. It's voluntary. I mean, well, especially for a very liberal institution here, it's very, uh, you know, traditionally uh, liberal in the sense that there's been a separation of church and state on steroids at places like University of Wisconsin. But yeah, other people have said any kind of organized religious activity violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which, of course, you say is nonsense. But No, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. So unless you're establishing a state religion, uh, well, even that you can do, according to... I mean, Congress is not involved in that. Right. So... You, right. Go ahead. Um, oh, I was about to say, you know, Congress is... Is uh, you know even even Congress has a chaplain. Uh, you know they they pay out of the national treasury a chaplain of Congress. They pay chaplains in the U.S. military. They you know there are a number of uh, services that they provide to uh, religious people, and that doesn't violate the First Amendment either. Uh, and when so we that have it, in itself know, is not established religion. No, no, not at all. I mean, what church does it establish if you have? You know, in the U.S. military, you know, 4,000 Catholic priests and 6,000 uh, ministers of different Protestant stripes and, you know, 500 uh, Jewish rabbis and a couple of uh, imams for the, the Muslims who are in, in the uh, armed forces. I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't understand how that could even be construed to be a national church. Well, you know, what church does it establish is the question you go back to. You would have a good time with Andy Gaylor of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, based in Madison, by the way. They often cut radio spots in the hallway at our left-wing counterparts, and they would say that's the Christian religion. So hiring Christians as well as Jewish rabbis and Muslim imams for for the... Um uh, for, well, uh, no, I'm, I'm with you. I agree with you, by the way, Tom, on this. I'm just, we, no, no, I, I know. We live in the belly, of the belly of the beast here. Hey, well, you know, you're talking to a guy from the Boston area. We're, you know, it's just as bad here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I guess, I guess she would want, I guess she would want an atheist pastor. 
you know, to be uh, even Stephen. She put a placard up in the Capitol Dome, which was uh, had an atheist message, and then our former Governor Thompson put a Christian placard up, and there was a big controversy. They were both allowed to stand. We'll come back. Tom Edlin, our guest. We're talking the Constitution. I'm sorry the phones are down, but we got a great guest, so stand by. This is Outside the Box. Okay, our guest is Tom Edlin, who is a constitutional scholar, comes to us from the Boston area, writes often for the New American Magazine, and is a Thankfully, a, a teacher of uh, inquiring minds in high school. Uh, are they inquiring minds, Tom, or are they uh, minds full of mush? No, they're probably. Well, it's, I mean, it, it's a, you know they're kids, so they're going to be a combination. Yeah, you know, you're sure. going to get every stripe. So yeah, yeah. I would love your class sure. now on gay marriage and the recent Supreme Court rulings on Defense of Marriage Act, and also the standing, the lack of standing for the citizens group that tried to bring the case. Uh, to them, uh, your reaction to that, first on Defense of Marriage Act, essentially striking it down. Um, I know Justice Kennedy wrote the majority opinion. Justice Scalia was in dissent on that. How do you uh, how do you analyze that ruling? Well, I mean, I, I don't think the federal government really should have a role in determining what states do. Uh, and uh, so if a state does not want to, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm calling you from the from Massachusetts, which started this whole ball rolling, unfortunately. But uh, I don't think the federal government should get involved in telling states what to recognize and what not to. Well, Defense of Marriage Act was not a state matter. That was the federal congressional uh, action on the uh, defining traditional marriage in Bill Clinton's time. That was the one ruling, and on that, the states weren't involved. Right, but plus, I believe that... Defense of Marriage Act also included, yeah, it, it, it bound the federal government to marriage being a man and a woman, but it also said that states didn't have to recognize Massachusetts and, and whatever other states had recognized, uh, uh, you know, two guys being married. It, it, they, the states didn't have to recognize that. If, if Say, for instance, two guys were to get married in Massachusetts and then move to, uh, you know, Wisconsin, which does not yet recognize to... No, Minnesota uh, does, to, as of today. Oh, as of today, really? As oh, of I, today, I, they, I, it can in Minnesota. Uh, so, the I'm point... Uh, hello, Tom. Oh. Yeah, I was, so, was going to say, I was, I, I've got to check my papers. No, it's <laughs> uh, as of today in Minnesota. Now, is the... Uh, is, so, you are dis, your take on the DOMA ruling, then, is what? Well, I mean, I didn't read the te- the full text of it, but but my take is uh, I think it's it's best. You know, marriage has has always been a state matter. It should remain a state matter to the extent that it should be a state matter at all. I mean, I I've known people uh, who uh, have have gotten married, uh, but not in the size of the of the state for tax reasons. And I've known, I mean, you know, there's a great movie called Shadowlands that uh, C.S. Lewis who uh, got uh, married in the eyes of the state uh, for to uh, help one of his friends get to um, uh, get immigration papers, and then eventually fell in love with this woman, and, and then married her for real in the church. So I, I'm not sure that the you know the government needs to necessarily get involved in this. I think the churches can pretty much take care of themselves. All right. So yeah, uh, um, on the question of the National Security uh, Agency and uh, the data mining on Americans' emails and all this kind of stuff, uh, Paul Ryan just said why he did not vote to defund. I had him on the show earlier. He said they're rewriting the law. He didn't want to defund while they were rewriting the law. That was his answer. Um, you feel strongly on this, obviously. Why do you think this is such an egregious violation of the Fourth Amendment? Well, I mean, the, the interesting thing is the, the Amash Amendment, which, which failed only by seven votes last week, would only defund, it wouldn't defund the NSA. It wouldn't be like a... Well, the spy you know, it would, program. Uh, uh, yeah, it, we, we, it wouldn't defund everything regarding this, the, uh, the NSA. It would only defund, uh, uh, the, it, would, it would only defund the unconstitutional provisions of the, of the, of, of the uh, NSA warrantless wiretapping. So, um, you know, for him to say, I don't want to do it while we're, we're rewriting the law, I, uh, I, don't, I don't get that. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is the debate last week was all about 
metadata and how the you know the, the the federal government is only taking what they call metadata. You know, the if you look at email, it's the the to from the time sent and everything. And what happened yesterday was uh, Glenn Greenwald uh, came out with uh, more information, uh, the Guardian in London, saying that uh, GVA NSA through a different program than the one that everyone's been talking about is taking the emails. It's called X Keystroke, and and they're they're taking all of that. So. Uh, you know, I don't know if Congress is misinformed or if people are 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 lying to the American people. You know that 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 has to be sorted out. Certainly, Mike Rogers, the chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, said explicitly both in a debate last week and on uh, Face the, CBS Face the Nation Sunday that they're not taking the emails when it, you know assuming. Uh, Glenn Green- Greenwald's uh, report is true about X keystroke. Uh, they are taking our emails. Yeah, pretty scary stuff, actually. Um, no, and that was a key amendment for the founders because they wanted to. Now that was the privacy. There's an argument of whether there is a right to privacy at all in the Constitution. Uh, would you argue that there is, and it's in the Fourth Amendment? I mean, the yeah, right to privacy. Several of our. Several of the, the amendments in the Bill of Rights relate directly to privacy. The Third Amendment, you can't bring soldiers into your house. The Fourth Amendment, uh, uh, against unreasonable searches and seizures, and you could argue the Ninth and Tenth as well. But the Fourth Amendment was ex- explicitly about a controversy in Boston, where it, in the pre-colonial era, or the, in the colonial era, where the British had these general search warrants. They would just get a warrant saying, we're looking for this, and they'd look in, in everyone's house. And there was a lawyer in Massachusetts, a state legislator named James Otis, who, who fought against it. And uh, he, he didn't win the battle in the, in the colonial period, but he made a, a very close case. And, and it was one of the main reasons that we put independence from England. Yeah. But, you know, in 67, the Griswold ruling on Connecticut's ban on contraceptives, I mean, that that, that ruling was because of a penundra of evidence. I mean, I don't know what it was based on. And then, of course, Roe versus Wade, Justice Blackman uh, somehow extrapolates uh, a woman's right to privacy or an abortion uh, under, I guess, privacy. Uh, I mean, that's been causing 40 years of, uh, of reaction. I mean, uh, I think even Justice Blackman's clerk, who, who agreed with the policy of uh, – abortion rights, disagreed with the ruling on legal grounds. Your take? Oh, well, yeah, the uh, Roe versus Wade decision was a, a terrible decision, precedent-wise, as well as looking at the, the sheer biology of it. I mean, you know, one of the first things I took, uh, you know, I started out as, I ended up as a political science graduate, but I started out as a biology student. So biology 101, the first thing they did was they say, well, biology is a study of life. This is the difference between you know, uh, you, uh, the student in the desk, and the desk you're sitting in, you know, and there are different qualities of life. A fetus is human life. I mean, there's no doubt about it. There's, there's, there's no debate. Uh, you know, it has all of the qualities of life, and it's no other kind of life other than human. So, you know, there is no right to privacy in killing another human being. Simple as that. Uh, you know, so we, we can make up these... Uh, uh, the, these these constitutional rights, and I, I think there is a right to privacy, but there's no right to kill another human being and do it do so privately. Uh, th- that's just not the case. Whereas Robert Bork said in his uh, questioning in '87, is there a right to do heroin in my own home? Um, you know, I suppose you would say no to that as well, right? I mean, well, no, I, I would. I mean, if I, you have laws I, against I, heroin, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't agree with with, with that. I mean, I you know. It, Again, going back to our Christian worldview, we we don't have the right to do wrong. The only question then becomes, you know, it, it, you know, heroin is in no respects a you know beneficial uh, drug to use. So, uh, you know, to what extent do we want government to go after it if it's a victimless crime? And there are, I, I think, in that case, you probably do. Uh, I think that there are. You know that there are there are the drugs. Well, there are know, laws like against marijuana. there are laws against using it. Is my point, but oh, right. there are there are, and they yeah. don't. Yeah, and, and of course he didn't. Uh, you're right. I, I'm not catching your point, but you 
you're right. There is you can take that to the extreme. Yeah, you can't. Uh, but, yeah, you have right. You can't do it because you're doing it in private. Anyway, Tom Edlin, our guest, we're out of time. Tom, you were great. I love talking about the Constitution with a guy who knows it. We appreciate it. Good luck out there in Massachusetts. Go Red Sox. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All take right. care. Go Packers. And cheer right. on the Celtics right. with my own modern former coach, Brad Stevens.